A Psalm of David, when he fled from the presence of his son Absalom. O Lord, why are they that affect me multiplied? Many rise up against me. Many say concerning my soul, there is no deliverance for him in his God. Pause. But thou, O Lord, art my helper, my glory, and the one that lifts up my head. I cried to the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy mountain. Pause. I lay down and slept, I awakened, for the Lord will help me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people who beset me round about. Arise, Lord, deliver me, my God, for thou hast smitten all who were without cause my enemies. Thou hast broken the teeth of sinners. Deliverance is the Lord's, and thy blessing is upon thy people. Psalm 3 a Psalm of David when he fled from the face of his son Absalom. When Absalom was cruelly attacking his father David, the speed of his mule caused him to collide with a thick oak tree, and the branches round around his neck so that he was suspended high in the air. This was a prefiguration of the Lord's betrayer. Just as Judas ended his life in the knot of a noose, so also David's persecutor breathed his last through the pressure on his throat. The history of the kings is evidence that this psalm is later in its event than is Psalm 50, for the persecution by his son Absalom is known to have occurred after David's sin of adultery and murder. Yet clearly the character of the psalm is associated with its apt number, for it was right that the psalm which embraced the power of the Holy Trinity and the mysteries of the resurrection on the third day should hold third place. The deliverance of David fittingly signifies the Lord's resurrection, so that the minds of Christians may be strengthened and encouraged in consistency in times of adversity. A similar example of lack of observance of chronological order is in the eight books read before Job, for it is acknowledged that Moses lived many years after him. So for the most part, the order of readings is arranged not according to chronology, but according to the nature of the writings. Remember that some psalms touch only briefly on the passion and resurrection of the Lord, while others recount them more clearly and openly. This is the first of the psalms with brief mention of them. The Vision of the Psalm This whole psalm is aptly attributed to the person of Christ the Lord. His person is the strength of the Almighty Godhead and the humility of the humanity which he embraced. But the two do not mix through intermingling, but exist in indivisible unity. To begin with, he addresses the Father with chiding of his persecutors who were uttering impious words against him. Secondly, the faithful people were instructed not to fear death when he consoles them with the hope of most certain resurrection following the precedent of their Maker. Why, O oh Lord, are they multiplied that afflict me? This exordium seems similar to that of Psalm 2, but in that case the query is one of rebuke, whereas here he is surprised that the people are aroused against him, since it is known that he has come to save them. By saying, they afflict me, he shows that he is considerably grieved at the blindness of those who have rejected his salvation with unbending minds. As he is to say in Psalm 34, they repaid me evil for good, to the depriving me of my soul. Many are those who rise up against me. Many say to my soul, so numerous were they, that they included even one of his disciples, the traitor Judas. The repetition, many, reveals the bitterly huge number of the wicked, that dense crowd of conspirators which could not thin out. This figure of speech is called Amphibias, repetition of words out of eagerness to enumerate them, so as to magnify the matter under discussion. There is no salvation for him in his God. This is with reference to the well-known words of the Jews when they said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. They thought that the Father did not love the Son, since he allowed him to be killed in the flesh. 
What an utterly foolish statement from that evil mob. Was it not necessary for the redemption of the world to be associated with weakness? Insatiable death could be overcome only by life's entry into the gates of that tyranny. Darkness cannot persist when excluded by the presence of light. But thou, O Lord, are my sustainer, my glory, and the lifter up of my head. Sustainer, that is, of the form of slave, since the taking up of human nature is the word made flesh. So it is the flesh which speaks of its glory and the lifting up of its head. For the all-powerful word assumed it so that the divine and human substance might be one person without any admixture. This verse is relevant, too, to the confounding of the Pelagians, who believe that man can by his own efforts achieve something good, for who, pray, could be self-sufficient for performing good without abundance of divine grace. It is through grace, by which it is united to God, that human nature has taken its place at the Father's right hand. Blessed Augustine has explained this helpfully and in greater breadth, as is his fashion. We have here the splendid figure called by the Greeks auxesis, which increases and redoubles by appending words and individual phrases. The psalmist says, But thou, O Lord, art my sustainer, my glory, and the lifter up of my head. Paul exemplifies the figure more broadly in the words, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or the sword, and the rest? Close to this is a figure called climax, or gradation, when praise or blame raises step by step, so to say. The difference between the two figures is that oxesis develops without repetition of words for things, whereas with climax, the final word of the first phrase must certainly be repeated in the following phrase, as in this passage of Paul. Knowing that tribulation worketh patience, patience trial, trial hope, but hope confoundeth not. I have cried to the Lord with my voice, and he hath heard me from his holy mountain. In saying, with my voice, he reveals the most sacred purity of his own speech. No mere surface appearance could impair his integrity, which is often removed from other men through weakness of the flesh. The words, I have cried to the Lord with my voice, are affirmed by the gospel passage, where the Son says, Father, glorify thy Son, and the rest. The word, my, shows that he has spoken also through the prophets. The following phrase, and he hath heard me from his holy mountain, is likewise explained by the gospel passage in which the voice came to him. I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Mountain signifies in various contexts, most aptly the Lord himself, his saints, and the church. Here we must understand the word in the sense of the preeminent peak of the Godhead, as in the words of another psalm, Thy justice is as the mountains of God. For it was right that the nature which took on humanity and demonstrated a unique example of patience on earth should in heaven gain the highest place of all creatures. I have slept and taken my rest, and I have risen up because the Lord hath taken me up. The psalmist comes to the second section, in which the hearts of waverers were strengthened so that they should believe that he whom they were to see crucified at the hands of wicked men would speedily rise again. I have slept, he said, because he quickly rose again, for in such sleep is the element of life. There is no end to life in it but temporary rest. I have taken my rest denotes untroubled suspension, unlike that of the wicked, who are agitated in death, and continually disturbed by awareness of their sins. This rest was the blessed sleep of the holy body. Rising up means eagerly getting up again, for the flesh laid aside its mortality and embraced immortality and external glory. He clearly explains why he rose up, because the Lord hath taken me up. The nature of humanity could not have risen again by itself and by its own strength. The divine omnipotence had to bear it up. As Christ himself says, I had the power to lay down my life, and I have power to take it up again. I will not fear thousands of the people surrounding me. 
He could not fear the wicked people, for his divinity afforded him protection. It was written in the gospel that at his passion a great crowd of people surrounded him. The words, I will not fear, do not connote that he will die. He could not fear death because he foreknew that it would last for only three days and that it would be of service to the world. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for thou hast struck all them who are my adversaries without cause. Not that God is roused from sleep or rest, but the divine scriptures and explanation of some matters often make metaphorical statements about God after our manner of behavior, a metaphor being an expression translated from its own sphere to one not its own. Save me, O my God. This refers to the resurrection. The end of his life, which was to be of service to mankind, broke in no deviation. Adversaries refers not only to his death, but also to issues which concern heretics, who have no zeal for the truth, and assail the Catholic norms with debased doctrines. Such men are rightly stricken with mental blindness, for they have involved themselves with debased desires. Thou hast ground down the teeth of sinners. In other words, the biting statements of slanderers, who with wicked beliefs confront the divine power. Dentes, teeth, derives from demere, to remove. So detractors' tongues were well called teeth. For just as teeth remove particles of food, so these tongues gnaw at men's beliefs through slanderous comment. But the words could also be applied to the Jews, who said, if he be the king of Israel, let him come down from the cross, and we will believe him. Thou hast ground down. In other words, reduce them to nothing. They are truly ground down, for they know that he whom they strove to kill out of disdain for his humanity has risen in glory. Salvation is of the Lord, and thy blessing is upon thy people. This utterance is directed against those whose teeth he earlier said were ground down. For by declaring that salvation is of the Lord, he confounded those who believed with despicable complacency that they were depriving Christ of salvation, as though he were an earthly man. Why, evil ones, do you toil to no purpose? How can eternal life be cut off, or the Savior's salvation be in any way lopped off? The blessing is upon thy people. By this one sentence, he both enjoined on men what they must believe and promised what they can receive from him. Conclusion drawn from the psalm. This is a short psalm, but it annihilates the boundless wickedness of pagans who believe that the glory of the heavenly majesty could not have descended to the humility of suffering. How foolish they are, for their thinking is confounded by the source of the world's realization that it has been freed. As Paul says, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the chief. Let us now consider how the true order of the heavenly wisdom is deployed. Psalm 1 contains the Lord Christ's moral aspect. Psalm 2, his natural aspect, that is, his human and divine being. And Psalm 3, by speaking of his resurrection, his reflective aspect. The rationale of these runs through the whole of the divine scriptures. So the patriarch Isaac dug three wells, thereby showing that the Lord's commands are contained in threefold teaching. Wisdom, too, warns us to describe men in their hearts in three ways, and so on. As you read subsequent psalms, you will be able easily to recognize these three aspects, individual or combined, even if you are not reminded of them. You must not demand such notification repeatedly, for I have numerous points to make which are new to you. The Holy Trinity teaches the purport of this psalm, for though it has the nature of indivisible unity, it clearly consists of three persons. Please consider subscribing to this channel, click the notification bell, give it a thumbs up, and leave a comment. This will result in the YouTube algorithm spreading the scripture to a larger audience.